All right, we are recording. So welcome everyone um, to our call, the uh, Ireland Land, Lore and Craft webinar. Um, we are gonna get started by just talking a little bit about some basic housekeeping rules for Zoom and um, then we're gonna get started. So uh, when you come on, please mute yourself. Uh, if anyone's calling in by phone, you can mute yourself by hitting star six and then unmute yourself with the same command. Um, there is a chat space that you can use, um, and that is uh, something that you can use to post questions and things like that. Um, it's a little distracting if there's tons and tons of chat going on, like extended conversations while we're presenting. Um, but if you want to just post a question there that we'll hit in the question and answer period, that's very welcome. And um, there will be a question and answer period at the end if you have questions about anything that we shared. And the recording will be available in a few days. It takes Zoom a tiny bit to, to process that, but I'll send that out as well in case you wanna share it with your friends or watch it again. And uh, our recording is rolling. So if you don't want yourself visible by video or whatever in the recording, then you should shut off your video, which is uh, on the lower left-hand corner, but otherwise you're very welcome to leave it on. Um, okay, so welcome everybody. Um, and I would also like to take a moment to welcome um, the, the ancestors, the spirits of the land, um, all of our supporters in the unseen world um, who are here to support this work. And to also acknowledge um, and send honor and gratitude to the Abenaki people in Vermont, which is where I'm speaking to you from and where Molly is speaking to you from. And also the ancestors of place in Ireland and in Sussex in England. Um, where Lucy and Angie are joining us from. And uh, to just acknowledge and affirm the sovereignty of indigenous people on the land and uh, invite you to take a moment wherever you are to send prayers of support and respect to the indigenous peoples uh, who are uh, the keepers of the land that you're on and to celebrate their legacy of survival and resilience and all that that teaches us. Um, so I'm going to give a quick uh, introduction to the presenters so you know who's going to be talking to you today and then we're going to launch into uh, the things we have to offer today. So I'm Murphy Robinson. Uh, I'm the founder of Mountain Sign Expeditions. I've been a wilderness guide for 15 years. Um, I actually first learned to lead hikes in Yorkshire, England on my year abroad. So I'm very excited to be going back to Ireland to be leading hikes uh, in that similar landscape there. And uh, I am of Irish, Scottish, English, and Welsh descent, among other things. Uh, so I have an ancestral connection to that land that I feel very strongly when I'm there. Um, I led my first trip to Ireland in 2018, a couple of years ago. I'm excited to go back and to revisit the, the Burren region, uh, which I visited. I, I went a few days early last time I led a trip and like went on my own little hiking trip and it was totally mind-blowing and I was immediately like, oh, I need to bring other people here. This is amazing. We need to do this again. Um, so I'm excited about that. And I will be sharing about uh, place-based land connection and uh, like slower travel experiences. Um, after my presentation, you'll be hearing from Lucy O'Hagan, who is Irish and joining us from County Meath. She's the founder of Wild Awake, which is an ancestral skills school near Dublin. Um, she's passionate about supporting people to reestablish their connection with themselves, their communities, and to nature, of which we are a part. And uh, she's going to be sharing some stories about the goddess Brigid in honor of the Gaelic holiday of Imbolc, which is around this time of year. Um, then we'll be hearing from Angie Nash. She's the director of Panache Adventures in the UK. Um, she's offering wilderness skills classes over there and also a series of international adventures that are really cool if you want to check them out. And um, Angie is going to be showing us how to create a small basket with hedgerow plants, which is one of the activities she's going to be leading us in on the trip. And uh, Molly it will be speaking to us last. Um, she is going to be our cook and hearth keeper on the trip. She's a Scotch-Irish American woman living in Montpelier, Vermont. And uh, she formerly ran a catering business there with her sister. In 2000, in, um, I'm hearing a little bit of background noise. So if you just jumped on the call, if you can hit mute, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and let's see, I'm fine with that. I'm so sorry, Island. There we go. Um, and uh, 
Molly is going to share with us insights from the time she spent in Ireland in 2009 working on various farms and learning local lore and foodways there. So that's our lineup for today and we're going to jump in and get started. Um, can you all hear those dogs barking in the background? Is that annoying? I'm at a friend's house that has better internet than I do, but they also have dogs. So hopefully that's not annoying you all. Um, hope the computer's not picking it up. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and start with what I want to share with you today, um, which is some reflections on the ways that we, um, the ways that we approach tourism, uh, especially the ways that Americans tend to approach tourism. And uh, the typical like classic American going to Europe experience is this really rushed experience that is operating under this false paradigm of like getting your money's worth and quantity over quality kind of. Um, you end up only seeing a lot of the big name sites. Um, this keeps you in like the tourist zone of the country and you're not actually interacting with that many folks who aren't like just designing their interactions to work for tourists. Um, so you're not um, encountering the cultural differences that can be really, really ed educational and enriching when you're traveling. And it's exhausting. You're like spending all of your time in transit. Um, when I first started telling people I was going to lead trips to Ireland, they were like, oh, are you going to go see a bunch of sacred sites? I'm like, no, I mean, yes, but like not the ones you've heard of, you know, I'm going to go see these like little remote stone circles or wedge tombs or something in some cow pasture and really take some time with them. And, and people have plenty of ability to go see the Hill of Tara on their own. It's easy to get there. Um, but we're going to do the things that it's harder to do on your own if you don't know the country. And um, so one of the things that I really focus on both in when I'm leading trips and when I'm doing my own travel um, is going to the smaller, more out of the way places. And I've really been trying to keep in mind this idea of the spirit of, of place um, from an animist perspective. And animism is the philosophy or religious uh, worldview that everything has a consciousness. You know, the stones, the trees, the stars, the plants, they all um, have a consciousness. And this is a perspective shared by a lot of indigenous peoples around the world. And uh, from this animist perspective, there, each, each place really has its own spirit. And um, in Latin, they had a word for this long ago. Um, the word was genius loci, or the presiding god or spirit of a place. Um, you know, genius, we think of it as this word about mental stuff, but it's also like a spirit um, with intelligence uh, in a place. And this spirit might have been protective of a place, um, and also definitely had its own priorities and goals and was not there to serve humans. You know, this is outside of the like Judeo-Christian concept of like all of these creatures are here for man's dominion or whatever. This is acknowledging that creatures are there for their own experience and the spirit of place is there uh, for its own reasons and has its own priorities. And because um, the spirit of place or the genius loci is considered this independent being uh, that can think for itself, indigenous cultures all over the world have traditions of making offerings to this spirit of place so that it will be well disposed towards them and bring them luck and you know not not make them starve off the land and that sort of thing <laughs> um and uh, that includes european cultures you know it's it's typical when we're talking about like animism or making offerings to the land that we think of non-european indigenous cultures but it's really really crucial that we remember that um, if we are of European descent, our own ancestors were doing this too, and in many cases are still doing this in forms that we just like don't think of it the same way, but it's totally the same thing. Um, I mean, all cultures are different. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's not as different as we tend to think it is. Um, so, for example, in Sweden, where I've led trips, um, people will make offerings to the Tompton, the like spirit of the homestead that you're in that kind of like tends things. There's some wonderful children's books about the Tompton that my mom read me growing up that I loved. But when we were there, we, we made offerings to the, the spirit of place and to the Tompton where we were staying. And um, in Ireland, there's a lot of people who still um, consider making offerings to the fairies, the little people, the she, there's many words um, for the, the beings of the land in Ireland. It's like a well-developed concept in the traditional culture there. And um, some things that are traditional in a European context um, to leave out as an offering might include like a bowl of milk or a shiny coin, um, something that's 
of great value in, in that culture and in a traditional farming culture, like a nice warm bowl of creamy milk is like the wealth of your farm. Um, so you can also connect to the genius loci through meditation and mindful observation of nature. It doesn't always have to be about giving offerings. Um, and in fact, in some old Druid traditions, I've heard that the Druid augury was about um, observations of nature. So you could just, you know, you didn't, there's types of augury in old Europe where you would like slaughter a pigeon and look at its entrails and, and read the future off of that or something. Um, but in Druid culture, there was a lot of just, you could just go for a walk in the forest. And, you know, if you saw a fox and it ran across your path going to the left or going to the right, it would like mean different things. And there was a whole way to interpret the signs of nature and, and what they were telling you. And that's a skill that a lot of modern people have kind of lost, but you can you can rebuild it and you can start paying attention and approaching it with curiosity and wondering what the spirit of a place might be telling you. And uh, so I just want to give you some some personal examples of experiences that I have had um, visiting places that felt powerful. Um, and one is from my junior abroad in college when I went and visited Stone Circles in southwestern England. And um, I went to Stonehenge, of course, you have to go to Stonehenge. And Stonehenge is like very sanitized and like the grass is all mowed very nicely and there's an asphalt trail that goes around the stones and there's little like explanatory plaques and you're definitely not allowed to approach the stones. You're not allowed to like touch them or stand among them, you know, unless it's like the solstice and they let people in um, on like a religious basis. But um, it, you know, I feel like a somewhat powerful spot, but it didn't feel like that power was something I could connect to. It felt like there was like this sort of sheet of plastic between me and that and that power because of the way that it's presented. And also that there were a lot of other people around who weren't necessarily looking to connect to the spirit of place or thinking of these stones as like a, a modern power, place of power or spiritual center. So it's like, you kind of hesitate to like sit down and cross your legs on the asphalt pathway and like try to have a meditation experience because there's all these like tourists walking past you. Um, so it's just hard, it was felt hard to connect. Um, and a couple days later, I was staying at a small out of the way hostel in Cornwall and they had uh, hiking maps that you could borrow at the hostel. So I took the hiking map and I opened it up and I was like, wow, there's like stone circles marked on this map. And I like asked the hostel host and they're like, yeah, you can go walk to them. They're, they're just there. Um, so I, I went out and I walked to a few of these stone circles, probably like three or four miles out into the, the landscape. And um, they were just so amazing. Like it was a, a small circle, you know, um, the stones were maybe like the size of a large sheep or something. They weren't these like towering Stonehenge um, megalith type things but they were arranged in a circle and the place just had this presence and I was there completely by myself so I was able to sit down and like lean my back against the stone and sink my consciousness down to the earth there and just like commune with that place and feel a great deal of power in that place um, and it just felt like this really intimate encounter and um, you know, if you ask me today, like, do you want to go back to Stonehenge or do you want to go back to that little nameless stone circle in Cornwall? I would absolutely pick the nameless stone circle in Cornwall because I felt like I was really able to build a relationship with that place and there wasn't a filter, like a tourism filter between me and it. Um, and I had a similar experience two years ago when I went to the Burren region, in, which is where we're going to be leading this trip. And um, the Burren is crisscrossed by um, this web of trails called the Burren Way. It's not just like one trail, like the Appalachian Trail. It's like a bunch of choose your own adventure choices on, in the trail. And uh, again, they have these ordnance survey maps, which are these really wonderful detailed maps um, put out by the government. And they have uh, archaeological sites marked on them. So they'll have like cairns and wedge tombs and like old children's cemeteries and all these things. Um, and you can just walk up there and find them. And uh, me and the friend that I was hiking with, we hiked pretty high up on this ridge in this series of cow pastures. Um, and we got to this spot that had a bunch of tombs marked and, and it was easy to find them. They were, they were like semi-collapsed, you know, they weren't, these weren't like the, the really popular sites that are well maintained or anything like that. So they were these wedge tombs that had like these long straight like wall pieces and then what had once been a roof but it was all kind of like collapsed over to the side 
Um, but we could really just be there with those stones and thinking about the Neolithic peoples that built that place and what it might have meant to them, because we still have very little ability to interpret that, um, even given the archaeological work that's been done. And, you know, why that one spot, what was the view there that would have been maybe similar in those times and, and uh, what community was around there and to really just try to like listen to the voices of the ancestors in that place. It felt really similar. Um, so I want to just really quickly go over um, a tiny bit of the history of this place. Um, and uh, so we're going to the, the Burren region in Ireland, which is on the west coast in County Clare. And uh, the Neolithic peoples there were the first agricultural society. Um, in the Mesolithic era, there were hunters and gatherers that didn't leave a whole lot of uh, archaeological evidence because they were living lightly on the land. But once agriculture became part of the society, they started building megalithic tombs. And um, this region has a huge concentration of them. And uh, the most famous one is the Polnabrone portal tomb, uh, which is apparently the most photographed thing in Ireland. Um, and I'm sure we'll go visit that during the week. Um, it's just about in the middle of a big field. So it's um, not, not very, not a crowded site. Um, and uh, then there are also these smaller wedge tombs. And there are 80 of those in this region, which is the highest concentration of them in Ireland. And um, not that many of these tombs have had detailed archaeological work done, but the um, Polnabrone portal tomb has been studied by an archaeologist named Ann Lynch, and she found the bones of 22 different humans um, under this tomb, and uh, they were of a variety of ages and sexes, and they seem to have dep been deposited there over 600 years. So for at least 600 years, there was a community here that built this structure and was making regular it was in regular relationship and making regular deposits of bones that may have been leaders in the community or spiritually significant people. Um, it's, you know, sort of the way we think of relics today, you know, um, important, important bones that can be worshipped or that might offer healing. Like, well, who knows what these people were, were intending when they deposited these bodies in this way. And there's evidence that they were like buried or cremated elsewhere and then their bones were brought there um, ceremonially kind of afterwards. Um, so, and also they found jewelry and stone tools and stuff in that area, but it was definitely like a cultural center um, of some kind. And uh, so that's just a little bit about the tombs, which I think are really cool. And then the basic history of the landscape here, um, it's a very, wide barren landscape uh, with what's called limestone pavement. There's a lot of um, limestone and then there's like grassy turf over that. And the dairy farming is one of the predominant agricultural activities there. And it wasn't always wide and open like this. So in the 16th century under Queen Elizabeth I, the English were really aggressively settling Ireland. They were colonizers in Ireland. And um, the natural peak ecosystem of Ireland is the oak and hazel forest and it's a really amazing ecosystem and Queen Elizabeth's military advisor told her that they needed to cut the trees in order to quote deprive the rebels of their place of succor unquote unquote um, so they basically the, the Irish army that was trying to resist the settlement was like hiding out in the woods and um, they cut all the forest so they would have no place to hide and then they used the trees to build, you know, naval vessels and trade vessels, including slave ships, because that was going on at that time. And all of this was just sort of a theft from Ireland, not only financially, I mean, the English saw a huge financial advantage to this and the Irish saw nothing of that, but also the forests were deeply culturally important to Ireland. And we can infer that based on the fact that no other country has as many place names connected to the forest as Ireland does. Um, so it was this, this there's a great grief around this taking of the forest. Um, but what happened afterward, I think, is a real symbol of resilience that uh, the soil you know, eroded a little bit and what was exposed were Arctic wildflower seeds from the last glacier that had come through Ireland. And these seeds were somehow still viable and sprung forth. And now the burn is home to 1100 plant species which is three quarters of all of the individual plant species in Ireland, like three quarters of that biodiversity is found in the burn. And it's an incredible site during wildflower season, which is why we're going in May. Um, so that's just a little bit of the amazing history of this land. 
And uh, I think that we come to know a place in a truly embodied way when we like hike its paths, sit by the ancient stones, meet the native plants, and even taste the local wild foods. Um, so that's the framing that uh, I wanted to offer, uh, whether you're gonna come on this trip or do some travels of your own. So now I will turn it over to Lucy for some Bridget tales. Ramelgat Murphy, Giadit Sharmajan, Smisha Lishak. So lovely to welcome you all here. My name is Lucy and I'm speaking to you from County Meath today in Ireland. So yeah, I welcome you into my home this morning. I've got fire behind me, the heat of Bridget. So really, yeah, invoking her and her strength as I sit here with you today. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about the Festival of Imbolc, which is approaching. Um, and I'm also going to show you how to make a Bridget's Cross. So Bridget's Cross being a very traditional craft and practice that people and schools all over Ireland will be doing at this time of year. We'll often see like teachers going into their classrooms with bundles of these rushes ready to show all of the children there how to make them. So just to begin, um, I'd love to start with an introduction of Imbolc, what it is. So the Festival of Imbolc is one of the four great fire festivals in Ireland, along with Bialtana, Lunasa and Samhain. And uh, Imbolc takes place on the 1st of February. So it actually starts on the 31st of January is when our preparations start. And those preparations for people who are still like wanting to honour this tradition would be to like bonfires, to hang up their Bridget's Cross, to leave out a piece of cloth, particularly a little piece of red flannel. This is mine from last year. Um, to leave those outside or a bowl of water with some salt that as Bridget walks the land and brings back the light to the land, she would pass by and, and give her blessings to the house so that it might be safe from fire and from illness. So um, yeah, it's at this time of year that the Kailok, so the old woman of the land, the old hag, she has been ruling since Samhain up until Imbolc and it is now like on the festival of Imbolc that she will set down her blackthorn staff and Bridget will take up ruling of the land as the maiden. So Imbolc itself, the word comes from the old Irish, meaning in the belly, so referring to like the, the physical lambs in the belly of the ewes and also the seeds in the belly of the earth. So really find this in Ireland with so many of these ancient Celtic festivals. They had such a practical meaning for what needed to happen in the land, like what is physically happening on the land and just shows that real connection that the ancestors had to the different cycles here. So in bulk falls halfway between the winter solstice and spring equinox. And it's really clear that this festival has been really important here since the Neolithic. So about 30 kilometers southeast from where I'm sitting is the Hill of Tara, which Murphy has mentioned. Um, and at the Hill of Tara, there's a mound called the Mound of Hostages. And this is aligned with the rising sun on, um, on in bulk on the 1st of on the 1st of February. So this rising sun is really associated with Bridget and legend says that she was born at sunrise and it was the towering flame which reached from the top of her head and, and touched the sky. And the dandelion, the Taraxacum officinale here, which is just opening its yellow flower at the moment, that's really associated with Bridget. The Irish name is um, Lost in the Bride. So yeah, real connection with the plants and, and uh, the otherworldly beings of our culture. So, um, yeah, who is Bridget? Oh my gosh, it's, a, it's always a question which like floods my social media at this time of year with all the different claims of who she was or who she wasn't. Um, but I can, yeah, I can just tell you what I have come to know and come to learn. Uh, so her name, Bridget itself, means exalted one, bright exalted one. Uh, so really referring to her connection with fire and with the sun. And another suggestion is that her name translates as fiery arrow. 
So um, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Sorry, that's me blooping. Um, so Bridget was part of the Tuatha Dé Danann. So the Tuatha Dé Danann being some of the, the fifth invaders of Ireland and there are these otherworldly gods or goddesses, if you want to use that word. Um, and the head, the Ardri of the Tuatha Dé Danann was the Dagda, so the good god. And it said that Bridget was the daughter of the Dagda. And she is known to be a triple goddess. Um, so that referring to like the three stages of our life as maiden, mother and crone, but also really referring to the crucial skills that Bridget brings. So that of poetry, of healing and of smithcraft as well. She's also really loved here for her healing and protective powers. So um, yeah, there is like a few stories which really stood out for me about Bridget. Um, one being the, um, the sec at the second battle of Moitura. So there was lots of fighting between the two of the Danon and another race which came from the northwest of Ireland uh, called the Formorians. So at the second battle of Moitura, where actually the Formorian race won and the two of the Danon are sent into the land, Bridget's son, Ruan, is said to have gone onto the battlefield and was killed. And when he is killed, she rushes onto the battlefield and throws herself over the body of Ruan and begins to like howl and wail and grieve for her son. And it's said that she, in doing this, created the, like when well, I say ancient, it's not so ancient, but the poetic, really amazing poetic form of the king in Ireland. So that is a way of like letting out grief. Um, and it was really important in Ireland up until very recent times, there would have been keeners who would have been sent to wakes around the country to really like lubricate people's grief, you know, and sort of harkens back to a time when we had a much more, yeah, a much healthier relationship with our grief. So as I said before, when we look up Bridget online, there's so many different, like, yeah, there's just huge lists of everything that she was said to have done. Um, and I have one list here, um, which says that she has an extraordinary number of patronages. So that of Ireland, New Zealand, Australia, newborns, healers, milkmaids, milkmen, poets, blacksmiths, boatmen, fugitives, nuns, printing presses, barnyard animals, chicken, chickens, children whose parents are not married, seamen and seamen, <laughs> and poultry raisers. So um, yeah, she seems to have been a very busy woman, really. Um, but I think for me, what stands out about Bridget is that she was the goddess of transformation. So whether that's in birth, you know, she's very often invoked in birthing, um, also as a goddess of brewing, of metalsmith, of poetry, of this transition from winter into spring, she was really at the heart of these transformations. And um, also like bridges this gap between paganism and Christianity. So yeah, in Ireland, most people are familiar with her as Saint Bridget and 1st of February has now become Saint Bridget's Day. Um, so like as Christianity came through Ireland, her as a goddess was appropriated into Christianity. So I think they were really realizing that Bridget meant too much to the people of this land for them just to forget her entirely. So we do have records of who she was as a person and um, that she existed in the fifth century um, and she was the daughter of a chieftain, a pagan chieftain who was then converted into Christianity and he doesn't sound like a very nice man but he was trying to marry her off for a good dowry and uh, he invited loads of different suitors to come and see Bridget and when they went into the room to meet Bridget, it said that she pulled out her eye from her eye socket and let it dangle on her face. So all of the suitors were like, I'm not, not going near her. She's mad, no, not, not having anything to do with Bridget. So this sort of led her to follow her true path, which was to serve the poor and animals. And really like, yeah, suggests to me her very kind and charitable nature, but also like, how strong-willed and determined and completely defiant of authority she was. Yeah, definitely a woman after my own heart. Um, 
And another story that's really well known in Ireland and is particularly told in schools is the story of her cloak. So you might be familiar with Bridget's magic cloak. So when she went out onto the land with her team of women to find her monastery, she brought with her her cloak and she asked this pagan landowner if he would give her some land. And he, yeah, a little bit cruelly said, you can have whatever land your cloak covers. So Bridget took off her cloak and said to her friends to take a corner each. And as they walked out, the cloak grows and grows and grows and grows until she has an area of like about 12 square miles to find her monastery. Um, so she's a cunning, cunning woman. Um, and then she did find this monastery in Kildare. So Kildara, you know, um, Murphy referring to the amount of tree references in our place name. So Kildara translating as uh, Church of the Oak. Um, and this monastery is said to have been a double monastery. So it was open to not only like nuns and monks, but also to poets, to artists, to farmers, to craftspeople and to bards. So a lot of people suggest that Bridget was really the person who, yeah, kind of started this like famous Irish hospitality of welcoming everybody and everybody having that seat at the table. So when she arrived at this monastery, she is said to have lit a fire and this fire has been burning on and off since that time, since the fifth century. And it went out for a long time and was relit in 1993. So um, yeah, that fire is still tended by a group of Brigidine monk or Brigidine um, nuns who live there. Um, and uh, yeah, there's loads of really amazing references to her, which I personally find really, really interesting. Um, of her having shared a bed with her friend. I've uh, forgotten her name. Um, but uh, yeah, so perhaps suggesting at her being a lesbian, some people like to suggest. And also in one of the stories, um, there's a nun that comes to her with an unexpected pregnancy. And Bridget is said to have helped her sort it out to get rid of it. So perhaps like a, yeah, a hint at our first abortion. Um, and that's really amazing for like now thinking about, you know, marriage equality in Ireland um, came to pass with the referendum five years ago and the repeal of the AIDS movement uh, two years ago. And for lots of people, Bridget really came out as a heroine of this movement. And they were both like real victories of, of compassion. Um, so yeah, it's just to, to think about that, like on, on what Bridget holds for us now um, and how like her sort of silently dedicated nature, like her wily ways, um, her teaching us that duality and separation are complete illusions and that you can, yeah, you can achieve what you want if you do it with integrity and can lead with like ferocity and good humor at the same time. Um, it's a very inspiring person, a god, a saint. Um, and there's a, a huge movement at the moment in Ireland called Her Story. So really campaigning to introduce more teachings of famous women throughout history and mythology in our schools and also campaigning for the 1st of February to be, um, to become like a, another, like bank holiday for us. Obviously St. Patrick is really well known as our patron saint, but to have Bridget, Bridget like where she deserves as our matron saint as well. Um, and as part of that festival next week, uh, there's so many things happening around Ireland and uh, in Dublin in particular, as part of this Her Story movement, there is a group of, uh, trans women and non-binary people who are doing a light show and projecting images of trans women and non-binary femme identifying folk onto the walls of this festival just to show that Bridget isn't just this one like like one dimension of womanhood you know she's really encompassing of everybody that wants to listen um, so yeah I think that's like one of the most important things to remember about Bridget is that although there are, all, there are all these different versions of who she was and people claiming she was this or maybe approaching it from a very academic viewpoint, really like Bridget is such a personal person. Um, she means 
whatever you want her to mean um, and that's okay she's a lot about yeah transformation and acceptance so um, I just want to finish by showing you how to make this cross hopefully you'll be able to see as I do it so um, I'm using the rushes so the soft rushes the junkus species so these grow a lot in the kind of grassy wet areas of Ireland of which there are quite a few wet places here uh, so I start with like the thick rushes and you could also use you know like willow or thick grass if you have it in your area and um, so we start with two thick ones and I'm going to hold with my left hand and bend with my right hand so I'm pinching it and bending the rush in half and bringing it in between this one. I hope you can see that. So that's our beginning. And with my right hand, I'm always going to take a rush, pinch it and bend it, and bring it over the top of those two rushes and pinch. Again, moving with my left hand clockwise by 90 degrees, Taking a rush, pinching it, and bending it, and bringing it over the top. You're all, like effectively locking in these rushes, moving it through 90 degrees again. Bringing it over the top. Moving it through 90 degrees again. I have no idea if you can tell what I'm doing, but there are loads of really good resources online as well to find out how to make these. Um, pinching it over the top. Moving through 90 degrees. So Bridget's crosses have been made here for hundreds of years. Um, and the rushes traditionally would have been gathered on the 31st of January and the cross hung on the door. So I have a cross that's been on my door since I moved in here last summer and that will be burnt before I put up the new one. So constantly renewing that protection. And, uh, so we keep going in this motion, moving through 90 degrees as you put on a new one and building it bigger and bigger as you wish um, until you reach kind of that size. Um, so the story with this is that um, I'd I would actually, I would love to hear an older story if anybody had one, but that Bridget went to um, uh, an old man who was kind of in the throes of a fever um, and she went to him to help him heal and also to teach him about Christianity. So as she was sitting at the end of his bed, she picked up the rushes that were on the floor and began to weave this cross and explained to him Christianity. But also for me, I think it's like really, um, yeah, reminiscent of the four fire festivals of the four seasons of this like cyclical nature of, of our world. So I bind these together with just some wool, which has been dyed with blackberries in the autumn. I think that's something that we'll be exploring with Angie on this trip. So yeah, that will be hung on my door next Friday. Yeah. So wishing you all a blessed unvolk. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, I really look forward to welcoming some of you to this land in May. And I'm going to go ahead and mute myself again. Slan. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was amazing. I think that's the first time I've heard someone um, able to really link Bridget's myth with how, how that archetype is living on in modern activism. And that was really amazing for me to hear. Um, so thanks for everything you shared. Um, next, we're going to hear from Angie Nash, uh, who has traveled the world learning skills, um, ancestral skills, earth-based skills, and uh, she is going to show us how to make a hedgerow basket, uh, which is one of the activities that we're going to do together in Ireland. So 
Um, we do have a slight technical idiosyncrasy with Angie's presentation. Um, she has a computer that will pick up her voice and an iPad that will pick up her video and neither of them will do both. Um, so if you wanna see what she's doing, which is kind of the point of her presentation, you're gonna to have to pin her video. So if you are on a computer, you can scroll through and see the different profiles at the top or you can click the little grid to get it to go to gallery view. If you're on an iPhone, you would need, to, or some kind of smartphone, you probably need to like swipe left to find, um, find the panel that's got all of that. Um, I'm gonna unmute Angie, if that's the right one. And so you wanna find, it says Angie Nash, she, her, and Angie's against a, uh, a white wall there uh, with a striped scarf. And if you click on that picture, it'll give you a chance to pin her picture. And that way you'll be able to see the video because it'll otherwise it'll automatically switch over to the blank voice only feed if you don't do that. Um, so if you have questions about that, you can type them up in the chat and I'll try and manage that while Angie's presenting. Um, and also just for those who came on late, I've, I've mostly been like muting you as you come on because there's been some background noise, but you can unmute yourself if you need to and we'll have questions and answers at the end. All right, Go, take it away, Angie. Okay, so hopefully you can all see and hear me. Um, I'm gonna keep talking as if you can, and uh, if you can't, then obviously just shout out. Um, I'm more than happy if you can't see me because I'm, I'm so awkward about technology and being seen, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> I've just been a bit daft on, in front of the camera. It just makes me feel very awkward. Um, I should also explain that I'm at my mum's house and I can hear her in the background. She has been uh, told that I am doing this, so hopefully she will stay quiet, but I can hear pans going because the roast dinner is on, hurrah. So by the time I finish this uh, presentation and the whole uh, webinar, then hopefully my roast dinner will be there on the table, fantastic. Um, so yeah, as Murphy said, I will be um, talking about baskets during this session and on the actual tour, um, the whole idea hopefully is to discover all the different plant species on the Burren Coast um, and look at the different ways that we can use them. So whether it's for foraging to, to bring back some of these plants to give to Molly, to create something amazing that we can eat, whether it's because we're looking at something because we want to look at natural dyes, whether we're discussing the medicinal things, the folklore behind the plants, whether we can use it to make fire, all these different things. Um, we can look at but also one of the things I want to focus on while we're out there is baskets and um, I said uh, that we will go through a little bit now on um, actually how to make baskets the kind of basket that we're going to make when we're out there is going to be very dependent on obviously what we what materials we can actually work with um, so baskets themselves are as old as civilization as old as human civilization civilization they are thought to be older than pottery um, because they're obviously they're made from natural materials it's hard to know exactly how far back they go um, but certainly things like the coral basket tree which is what you still see a lot of indigenous tribes uh, places like Africa um, they will use this very simple method of creating a, a really strong basket that can also then be waterproof so it could end up being if we find no materials at all that seem workable from the hedgerows then we can also then focus back on working with something like this. This is, I don't know how well you can see this. Um, okay, but this is working with straw. So it's a really nice, simple way of just bundling. And this is what you do with a lot of coil baskets is you're, you're working with things that can be bundled. So it's any materials you can find. So whether it's grass, whether it's straw. Um, you guys, the first time I learned about pine needle baskets, I'm really messy. This was done really quickly. Um, but the pine needle baskets, the first time I learned that was actually on, on your side of the pond, anyone that's looking from um, America. So these, these have been done green. For those of you who know how to do pine needle baskets already, you would know that you wouldn't do it green. Um, you would wait for these to dry out. So um, what I would suggest is some of these baskets that I'm going to be starting today with the different materials. What I'll do is over the next few weeks when I've got time, I will finish them off. Um, and then post some updates uh, to Murphy so that you can then see how how this has developed into like a, a full basket. Um, 
to be honest, what I might end up doing is completely stripping this particular one back and drying these needles out properly because what happens with a lot of the materials that we use that we're gathering fresh, um, they will end up drying naturally and all of this that you're using to, to sew the threads and to sort of keep all these baskets in place, um, all these needles in place, they will just become loose and the basket falls apart. Um, but certainly, I mean, I'll, I'll end up bringing something like this to Ireland with me. Um, I will dry these needles out, do it properly, and then I can explain this process to you properly when we're out there. So like I say, it could be that we're using pine needles if we find those. It could be that we're using grasses. It could be as simple as using them. Um, so again, for those of you who do know about pine needle basketry, it's something that is very strong in the uh, south of America and um, Florida. Florida is really keen, but you have a, a pine tree called the long needle pine tree. Your needles for those are about that long. So when you're making these baskets, it's really easy. You've got a lot of material to work with. Whereas our needles are that long. So when you consider yours are that long, ah, they're this long. Okay, so it's, it's much harder and much more fiddly to work with. Um, but I I certainly can go through that process when we're out there. Uh, so if we're not going to be doing the straw or the pine needle core basketry, if we're actually going to be using materials from the head rows, then there are a lot of different materials that we can work with. So things like um, any sort of vines, um, ivy, um, brambles. Brambles, I don't know what brambles are like where, where you guys are from, but it's, it's certainly one um, over in the UK that tends to be quite prolific. It, it takes over huge areas. Um, it's massively important obviously for the wildlife. The berries that Lucy was talking about earlier, the, the blackberries we can we can use those for dyeing up and eating. Um, but for the actual brambles as well we can use um, to make baskets. So it's, it's a nice accessible material that we can work with. So again making a basket now is, is it's, a, it's a really really long process. So rather than making the entire basket in front of you it's, it's going to take too long. But we can do something like this with the brambles to make the bases. It's going to be smaller than this probably for the amount of time that we have and the materials available. Um, but when we're out in Ireland we can make that sort of base and then build it up and again over the next few weeks what I'll do is carry on doing this um, and then show you the process as it moves further and then eventually by, by the time we get to Ireland there should be that finished basket that I can then show you and then show you exactly how to make yourself one. Um, but what we can, what I do want to show you now, um, is the kind of basket that if we do find some decent head rose materials, it's probably the kind of basket that we will end up making. And it's, what I've started off with here is, um, this is holly. So I've already removed all of the holly leaves. Um, I've also got some bramble, which again, spent a bit of time um, just literally just scraping a knife along the, the edges to get rid of those thorns. Um, theoretically you should be able to just put on a, a gardening glove and get rid of that but I've never found that to work so I've just used a knife to scrape that. But what we're doing is essentially creating two rings and any material essentially that you can grab hold of and bend without it snapping and then twist to form a circle. Um, so like I say this is holly but any, any materials that you can do that with and that circle holds without cracking then we've got the makings of our basket. So what I ended up working with is my favourite, which is ivy. Um, so this is your starting point for the basket. And what we've got here is one circle, similar to what we've just created there, and then a second circle that goes all the way around. And this is just ivy that's been, um, it actually came, came down, I didn't even uh, harvest this myself. This was on the ground and it just naturally because it's a, a plant that grows on other plants the climber it just naturally creates all these beautiful twists which this will end up being the, the handle of the basket um, so it's very decorative it's very strong uh, more importantly for basketry making with hedgerow materials it bends rather than snaps so with a lot of these plant materials when you start hearing like all these different crunches and cracks you're like oh god snapping whereas with ivy it's beautiful you can hear the crunching and you know that actually it's not going to snap on you it just it's compressing and becoming even stronger so we, we create these two circles 
And then, I don't know how well you can see that there. But what we're doing then is making this four point, if I show you from the other side, with the magic of technology, without knocking down. Oh, no, where are you gone? <laughs> I can see you in there somewhere. Okay, there you go. Uh, so I've got a very precarious setup here. We're trying to balance the, the iPad on top of the computer, but I don't know how well you can see that, probably not very well at all. But there are these four points where you're connecting the cross, and yet it actually is very similar to the, the Bridget Cross um, that Lucy was talking about earlier. So it's also, some people may know this as the God's Eye Cross, but it's a very strong way of, of forming these ridges, um, these rings together. Because that's the handle. So if I can find a piece of material. This is more ivy. You can see how flexible and how bendy this is. This was cut this morning, so it's lovely and fresh. So in order, you can leave these leaves on. Um, it makes a very beautiful basket. Obviously, over time, these leaves will just drop off naturally anyway. But if you don't want them on, you just run your hand down it with a closed fist. That moves all the leaves. It's going to be interesting to see how well I can do this <laughs> into the camera, but let's see. So like I say, this, this cross is already formed, but it's not big enough. It's not going to be strong enough at the moment for what for what we need. So what I'm going to try and do is just continue with this cross to show you how it's done. So you're looking for uh, a point where you can just wedge this one end in, tuck it out of the way. Excuse me while I do this. And the reason why I'm saying it's going to be impossible for me to show you an entire basket in the 10 minutes or so that I've got to talk to you is because you could easily be spending 10 minutes just fighting with the materials you've got. Um, plants are very good at fighting back. Okay, let's tuck you into there. So, can I see it on the camera? So you are essentially going around each point Very interesting doing this. Back to front. So you're wrapping it round. Okay. Two seconds whilst I look at it from back to front. Yeah. Wrap it round. Wrap it round. Oh no, that's already. See, this is what I mean. You're fighting all the time with these materials. Let's try a different one, because that could be. No, that should be right. I'm going to start off the, the, at the thinner rim to see if that works better. So tuck it again, tuck it in to secure it in place. Wrap it round one of your crosses. I don't know how easily you can see this. Okay, get rid of this rubbish. What I've also then found, being at my mum's garden, is this, I don't know if you can see this. This is actually jasmine. So I'm gonna try, again, because it's a climber, it should be lovely and soft to bend without snapping. Things like this, you really need somebody else filming you. So you've got all your hands free. But we're going to wrap it around. Pull that through. And then up. And then wrap it around. And you're essentially, all you're doing is just weaving around each of these four, one, two, three, four points. Wrap it around. And then 
and going underneath the next one. I'm doing it back to front, upside down, left to right, in the camera. <laughs> it's really difficult to see what I'm doing here. Okay, if anyone's not following this or is getting really confused, shout out. But Murphy, I'm looking to you at this point. Yeah, the image is really clear. I, I can tell what you're doing and I'm impressed that you're doing it like all backwards for us. <laughs> you can see what I'm doing and it's following the pattern. Okay, so yeah, kind of is, kind of isn't. Um, you can see how that structure starts to take shape. So like I say, things like, this is actually really good, this honeysuckle is working brilliantly. Um, ivy works really well. You can use things like uh, new tree growth. So you mentioned before about hazel historically being sort of prominent in that area. So hazel, new shoots of hazel is fantastic. Willow obviously is really great. Um, so willow up until about 200 years ago, willow was a huge industry over in the UK. Um, so all of our containers that we took uh, to market to transport things, um, fish traps, coffins, um, all sorts of things were made out of willow. But with the introduction of plastic, that industry is now massively dropped. So it's, it's really lovely to actually be involved in something again that is so tied up with our past, but also sort of going forward. It's such a, a sustainable method and sustainable craft to be sort of moving on with them and not forgetting. But also, it's, I think, a very beautiful piece. I mean, again, I don't know if, I've only got a really tiny screen, so I can't see how close you guys can see it. But this, this is ivy, and there's some really beautiful pinks lovely greens coming through um, so I think it is a, a very stunning craft so like I say what I'll do is over the next few weeks I will build on that god site I'll put another one on this end I will then put in um, the supporting beams like this one but more along the bottom and then what I'll do is start using a very similar weave to that to weave all of this and create yourself a basket and I'll, I'll put that process up uh, and give it to Murphy so you can see exactly what's going on um, and then what I do is also finish this off for any of you I don't know if you're beekeepers any of you beekeepers um, so again historically this would have been used to make the skeps so just straw needle and thread or needle and uh, uh, I think Lucy is going to be doing some string different types of cordage um, so again, it's something that you could easily make, uh, hopefully by the time this trip's finished. I apologise if that was an absolute mess, but it's really <laughs> difficult going forward. Um, thank you so much, yeah. Reggie. Say again? Thank you so much. That was a really beautiful demonstration. I love that you were sort of forced by the materials to show us a lot of the different stuff that's available, which is really great. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, any questions, ask me at the end. And now I can relax. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, if folks have pinned Andrea's video, you can go ahead and hit unpin um, on your screen. So it'll uh, move to the next speaker. Um, yeah, this is finding out how to use the native materials, the places, materials that are indigenous to place like that um, to make the basic needs of life. I think is such an amazingly powerful way to connect with the ancestral wisdom that lives in in the land and the, and the culture um, where we're going. So I'm really excited that we have both Angie and Lucy to to teach us those things uh, from the the European uh, rooted perspective and and knowing all of those plants and bringing all of their wisdom for uh, our adventure together. Um, so next we're going to hear from Molly, um, who is our cook and hearth keeper, um, and hear some tales that she has from Ireland and some reflections on the food we'll be eating. So take it away, Molly. Thank you, everyone, and hello. Um, my name is Molly, and I am really excited to be joining this crew of facilitators and uh, to be going to Ireland um, in May with hopefully some of you joining us. Um, I'm going to kind of annotate my time and, and just talk for maybe five minutes and tell you a little bit about myself, um, my connection to food, and then some of the things that I hope to uh, cook for you and uh, uh, bring to the table. 
uh, when we're all together. So I, I've, I've loved food um, and cooking my whole life. I actually learned to cook from my father. He was the one who cooked in our family and he learned to cook from his mother. And one of the, the things that he told us is that he was one of eight children. And one of the only ways that he could spend time with his mother was to either help her with the laundry or help her with the cooking. And he did both and uh, learned how to cook. And growing up, he was always trying new recipes and interested in flavors and taste and, and ingredients. And uh, one of my favorite stories and connections um, to cooking with him is that he uh, ate a dish called Cincinnati chili in um, Ohio when we lived there. And he fell in love with it so much. If anybody's ever had it before, it's a, it's a kind of an interesting chili. It has chocolate and cinnamon in it, kind of like a, almost like a mole, but it's, it's completely different. Um, and it's served over noodles and it has like all these different parts of it. It's, it's an experience. And he came away from eating that experience and really wanted to recreate it himself. So he started testing recipes and he started, you know, pulling in all the different ingredients to try and like find the exact flavor. And he did, and he, he made it and he said, this is it. This is how Cincinnati chili tastes. So it became a tradition in our family to make it. And I just feel so grateful that he's been like open and welcoming me to like learn that recipe. And we make his recipe uh, a lot of times when we're together. And it's a really fun memory for me from my childhood in this like interesting dish that, you know, if you haven't been to Cincinnati, Ohio, you may never have tried this chili before. Um, but for me, it's really, it's like the foundation of how I understand food as an experience. Um, not only with your body and nourishing your, yourself, but also with all of your senses and connecting with people that you're cooking with, connecting with the ingredients that you're using. And it's, it's really exciting for me. So um, professionally, I've been cooking food um, and I was a co-owner of a catering company, um, Woodbelly Pizza here in Montpelier, Vermont. And I co-owned that uh, business with my sister um, as well as two other co-owners at the time. Um, we did a lot of weddings and parties, and so I have a lot of fun and uh, experience cooking for lots of people all at once. Um, I really enjoy that, and that was a lot of food over open fire, which is another like experiential um, uh, food uh, relationship. Um, I also have a permaculture and horticulture background, so a connection to farms. And so I'm really interested in farm to table food, um, talking to people who have cooked their food, who have grown their food, and then, um, and then bringing that nutrition to the table uh, with a lot of cool yeah, flavor combinations and, um, and figuring out how to bring the, the flavor of the food out, especially fresh food. So I was in Ireland about 10 years ago or 11 years ago now in 2009, and I worked on a lot of farms. I was doing a woofing program, and I worked on a farm in Shannon, um, mostly growing vegetables and herbs, and we sold to some restaurants around the way, but we also went to the Galway Farmer's Market. Um, and so while we're there, I'm hoping to go to the Galway Farmer's Market and buy some, uh, some vegetables and fruits from... Uh, local farmers and bring that to our table so we can have that. And then just as Angie mentioned, um, I'm really excited to experiment and taste and try some foods that maybe we forage, some wild foods. Um, I have some experience uh, with that. I worked um, for a, um, a native plant and tree nursery in Pennsylvania and we ate a lot of wild foods. Um, we did uh, some pawpaws. Uh, we went around and foraged some pawpaws, which are, if you're not familiar, it's a native tree to um, Pennsylvania, and it has like a banana custard kind of taste and flavor to it, and it kind of looks like a mango. It's a round fruit with a green outside. Um, so we made all sorts of pawpaw custard and ice cream and, and kind of got exciting uh, and creative with all of that. Um, we all, we've also talked about maybe foraging some seaweed while we're on the trip and incorporating that into our menu. Um, I'm a big fan of pestos out of wild greens. Um, 
nettle pesto. Um, I've made garlic mustard pesto before, which tastes really, really good. And I enjoy that. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting, especially working with folks who know the land and know the plants. Um, I'm really excited to collaborate with you on that. Um, and so then just to kind of finish off, um, I wanted to say that a sample menu for the day, um, I'm, I'm still playing around with and I'm really excited about seasonal food and, and working with what's available there. So I'm, I'll be finalizing my menu once I'm there and can find out the, uh, uh, which, which fruits and vegetables uh, are available, of course. But um, I'm really excited to do like a mixture of things, like a lot of mornings to have like more of a relaxed continental breakfast of muffins and bagels and yogurt and fruit and things that we can just kind of casually go around and get with our coffee and our tea and our juice. Um, but then some mornings I'd really like to go and have like a big breakfast and we can do eggs and sausages and we can um, like have potatoes and do all of like a big breakfast for us. And then other mornings, maybe I'll do some soda bread with porridge. And so we can have a variety of things there. Um, I was thinking for lunches, we could do a lot of salads and sandwiches on the go, especially if we're gonna be out hiking. Um, I'm gonna make sure that we have lots of snacks. So if you're somebody who likes to eat a lot throughout the day, we'll have plenty of food available for that. And for dinners, I'm really excited to do stews and roasted vegetables, um, maybe a roast or two, and big green salads, fresh green salads, I think will be delicious and certainly a part of our menu. So that's just, um, that's just a little bit of uh, what I'm excited about. And uh, I'm really looking forward to creating, creating that and sitting around and having wonderful meals with all of you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. I can't wait. Um, I was telling Molly the other day, I've, I've, you know, led a lot of programs and been to a lot of uh, like conferences and things. And there's such a qualitative difference um, when we have a cook that's just really um, experiencing a lot of joy doing the cooking and putting a lot of love into the food and invested in connection with the, the local landscape and farms. And so I'm really delighted that um, Molly has agreed to come and bring all of her amazing skills on this trip as well. Um, so in just a minute, we're going to have a question and answer period if folks want to ask questions about anything we've been over. Um, but first, I want to give you a really lightning quick overview of uh, the trip that we're doing. You know, some of you might be on here like, wait, what is this trip? Um, so the trip is called Ireland on Foot, Megaliths, Wildflower, Flowers and Traditional Crafts in the Burren Coast. Um, it's May 9th through 15th in 2020 this year. And uh, it's gonna be a week of immersion in the burn landscape that I described, this landscape that was once a forest and is now like a wildflower meadow and a lot of dairy farms as well. Um, we'll be based at this really beautiful cottage uh, by a river right on the burn way. I actually, I hiked right past this cottage and I had a little sign saying you could rent it uh, when I was there two years ago. And I, in that moment, I was like, I'm gonna come back here and I'm gonna rent that cottage and I'm gonna take people hiking because this is amazing. So uh, we are able to actually go to that exact cottage, which is awesome because it's like right at a, a crossing of two trails there. So we can just hike, hike out of our, from our door, doorway. And um, this year the trip is open to women, trans folks and queer people. Um, if you're someone who doesn't fall into any of those categories and you wanna go on a trip like this, let us know and we can run it again another time perhaps. Um, but that's what we're starting out with this year. And um, we will be doing daily hikes. Um, we'll be doing craft projects, um, sharing stories and lore, especially Lucy's going to bring more of the mythological lore um, and storytelling to our circle. And of course, the amazing food that Molly described. Um, and the cost is $1,850 US dollars. Um, that's per person does not include airfare but includes everything else includes like shuttling you from the airport to the site and of course lodging and food and programming and all of that. Um, you can get more detailed information on the website that's mountainsongexpeditions.com including descriptions of all the different crafts we're going to learn um, with Angie and Lucy. Um, and about the hiking I want to say that we can really have this be a uh, collaborative, organic, co-created kind of hiking experience, uh, meaning we can do hikes of many different levels and we can do 
to different hiking groups in a day if people want to do different things. Um, and so whether you're looking for some really long challenging hikes or just some short strolls and then some time working on your hedgerow basket or whatever, um, we can see, you know, what are the, the fitness levels and ambitions of the people there and what are your priorities and what is the weather and make those decisions collaboratively. Um, and I just, I love doing it that way rather than being really rigid about like, well, we have to do this today because that's not how you get the, the most out of your experience here, your few precious days in Ireland. Um, and also, um, just for you folks on the call and folks will be listening to the recording, um, I'm doing a little early bird special on this one. So if you sign up before in bulk, which as you know now is February 1st, um, you will get $100 off on the trip. So um, it really helps us to be able to do the planning to like have an idea of we've got, you know, when we hit our, our basic numbers and stuff like that. So it's really helpful for us if you're able to um, make that decision and send in your deposit then. And um, let's see, was there anything else I wanted to say about all of that? Um, I think that's it for now. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions and answers. So most of you are muted in some way. So you'll need to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question verbally, or you can type a question into the chat box and I'll read it out. Um, I do have a few questions that someone sent in by email that they wanted us to answer. So I'll start with those. Um, one question is how many flights are necessary to reach location and how many buses? Um, if you're on the East Coast of the US, you can get a direct flight from either Boston or New York to Shannon. And you don't have to get on any buses because we're going to pick you up. So um, that we'll just, we'll have a, a rental van, a nine person van, um, and we'll meet you at the Shannon Airport in Ireland and drive you to our, our little cottage by a river in the Burren, which is like, I think an hour and 20 minute drive. Um, this person also wanted to know are we going to have to go down winding roads on buses? And will the hiking be very high up? Will it be suitable for people with fear of heights? Which is a great question. Yeah, there's some there's some winding buses you can take in the burn, but you don't have to take them for this trip. I've been on those those coastal cliffside bus bus um, routes uh, in the burn, and it's a little bit amazing at times. Nothing nothing like what I've heard about happening in Peru and stuff like that. But um, it's it's a beautiful way to see the coast. But we will be. Um, the, the the fastest route that I, I checked on the maps looks like an inland route um, to get there with our little shuttle van. And then, like I said, we'll be choosing the hikes collaboratively. So if you, you know, if, if one group wants to do a cliffside hike or like go down to the Cliffs of Mower and something like that, which is nearby, um, you don't have to be in that group. You can do something else that day and, and um, we can, people can choose what they want to do. It's definitely like, challenge by choice, choose your own adventure kind of thing. Um, so those are the questions that I had ahead of time. Does anyone want to ask a question live here? I have a couple questions if that's okay. Yeah, great. Go ahead. This is Aurora, um, she, her pronouns. And so I guess my two questions are fairly logistical, but first thank all of you for all of the just information about the trip, but also the like lore and connection that you brought into um, today, because it's nice to sit with all of that um, at this time of the year, particularly. So thank you to all four of you. Um, my questions are, um, one is related logistically um, to the shuttle. Like if there was a shuttle, would there be a specific time that would be ideal for like flights coming in and arriving? Um, or like when would be the latest we'd wanna arrive that day? Um, and the second is about food allergy things. Um, basically like gluten and dairy are things I generally don't eat. I can be near them. But so I was wondering if those are, if that's a possibility. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts. Awesome. Thank you, Aurora. Um, yes, we will have a time when everyone like needs to be at the Shannon airport by then. And I mean, obviously if your flight is late, we'll work with that because that's not your fault. But um, in my experience, the flights from the US all arrive in Shannon around the same time anyway. They're like red eye flights um, and they arrive mid morning in Ireland. Um, 
and uh or i don't know i would get confused which way the time goes but i, I never remember they arrived mid-morning in ireland and um we would definitely send you a, a specific time i think last time it's you either had to be there by 10 in the morning i think it was 10 in the morning but i can double check that um but I, like i said because of like how they just schedule the flights it's generally not hard um and yeah then we'll, we'll meet you with the van there and, and whisk you away and Molly, you want to speak to accommodating food allergies? Absolutely. So thanks for that question, Aurora. And um, yeah, it's absolutely um, uh, able to work with food allergies, sensitivities, all of that. On our registration form, there's actually a spot where you can just write that in. And that's for everyone, including allergies, um, preferences. And you know, if you're a vegetarian or if you're a vegan, um, I'm really looking forward to having that list. And once I have that list, I'll be able to even tailor the menu to that and figure out how we can make food that everyone can eat all together. That's my preference most of the time. So if I can make something that is, you know, hits everybody's points and it's accessible to everyone, then I will do that. And if I need to make something special, then I certainly will. Thank you, Molly. Thank Absolutely. you, Molly. Yeah, you're welcome. Anyone else have a question they want to ask? Um, one other thing I'll share, and people can jump in with questions still if they want to, um, is that this is a small group trip. Um, we can take a maximum of five participants on the trip. As you've seen, we have a fairly big staff team too, so it's a pretty good ratio there. Um, but um, because of the cottage we're staying in is not huge. Um, so we can take up to five people and that'll be on a first come first serve basis. And um, one of the seats is already filled. So if you are thinking you wanna come, it'd be great to get reserve your spot soon. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the way that we could have a really cozy hearth kind of atmosphere um, with, with a small number of people and really being able to connect with everyone on the trip. Um, we have a question that came in here on the chat. Um, would it be possible to hear more about the lodging scenarios? Yeah, for sure. Um, so this cottage, um, I've only seen it from the outside in person. I've seen the pictures on Airbnb. Um, but uh, it's a, like a medium sized cottage right on a little crossroads, um, sort of halfway up a hill over one of these like cow, cow pasture valleys um, in the Burren. It's called Fairmoyle Cottage, and uh, it sleeps eight people. Uh, that does not mean there are eight bedrooms, so you don't get, so get your own bedroom. Um, and um, there are, what, it sleeps eight, there's two double beds and four single beds. Um, so there will be some people, like some people will need to sleep together in a double bed, um, you know, just like back in Girl Scouts. Um, and uh, there also, if you if you wanted more of your own space, you could bring a, a sleeping pad to put on the floor or something like that. Um, but we could work out with people ahead of time, like who who needs a single bed and who's willing to share, and, and make sure that everyone's like uh, feeling good about those choices. Um, and we can also like there's different bedrooms, so we could have a like go to bed early bedroom or you know themed like bedrooms if that makes sense. Um, and there's a full kitchen there, um, and you know Molly will have snacks and you know, drinks and things to make things like that available, um, as well as a nice living room where we can like circle up and do like evening story time and work on crafts when it's raining and stuff like that. Last time I went to Ireland, it didn't rain once in the whole 10 days, which was very unusual, but I think it usually rains a little bit more than that. Uh, we have another question coming in. Could you talk about any impressions you got from these megalithic sites or any interesting sensations that came up for you when you're able to be mindful within that space? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, the main megalithic sites that I spent time with um, two years ago were these wedge tombs up in a cow pasture. Um, and it was after like a very long day of hiking. But uh, the, the landscape around them was incredibly striking. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me. I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable. But um, 
And um, so there's just like wind whistling all around and these beautiful wide, wide open views. Um, and I think it's a really good place to do like ancestor work. Um, I didn't take the time that day because I was like hiking with a friend and we wanted to get to a place um, to go really deeply into that at that site. And I haven't yet been to the Polnabrone tomb, which we're going to go to together. I'm really excited to go to that. Um, I didn't have a rental car when I was there. Okay, well, maybe while we're waiting for uh, Murphy to come back, um, and I know that their internet is kind of spotty where they're at right now. So maybe while we're waiting for Murphy to come back, if there's any other questions, um, maybe Lucy and Angie and I can do our best to answer them. There's a question from Anna Pei. Is this the first time this trip has happened? To my knowledge, yes. Um, this is the first time that this trip in its iteration has happened. Yes. Um, Murphy was saying earlier that they did their first um, class or trip in Ireland in 2018, but it was a different class than this. So, and I know that this is certainly the first time that uh, the four of us facilitators have all come together um, and collaborated on it. We're really excited to bring it, bring, uh, bring it to you. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions, things that you want to know about, um, Curiosities. Yeah, the, the she or the little folk can be pretty, pretty tricksy like that and even play tricks on our technology. They're wise to the times as well. Well spotted. <laughs> I guess we'll all have to go and experience it ourselves. I'll say for myself that I'm really excited to hear more and was really excited to hear today about the lore of Bridget. Um, one of my, and, and also the connection between the paganism and Christianity and that bridge that Bridget helped cross. Um, 
Bridget is part of my name and it's part of a family name. So I'm Molly Caitlin Bridget McElroy is, are my four names. And um, I took Bridget as my confirmation name. I was raised Catholic um, in uh, Arizona and in Pennsylvania. And there was, there was something about choosing it that felt like a defiance. I didn't want to choose a confirmation name. I didn't want to have that be part of um, my life, but I, I learned about Bridget and there was something about learning about how it was, there was this pagan aspect to her um, that I said, well, if I have to have one, then I will. And it's just really amazing to me that like that decision that I made when I was 13 years old is now still so relevant. Uh, in my life now, and that feels really good. So I love I love hearing about how Bridget's being raised up in Ireland right now, um, and that feels that feels exciting. Yeah, it seems like um, she has a lot to teach us. And one of the things that I kind of forgot to say that I, I wanted to mention was like this reference of her name meaning fiery arrow. And when I was reading this, I was really reminded of how Murphy signs off their letters of like, may your arrows fly true. And just this idea of like, what is it that we're putting out into the world? Like, what are your fiery arrows and where are you, where are you directing them? So yeah, it seems like you had some pretty fiery arrows in your quiver at 13 <laughs> even. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it's like, it feels like such an exciting time in Ireland, like there's been so much like movement in, um, yeah, like trying to shake off that shame that came with Catholicism and like, all the horrible things that have happened to the people in the land here. Um, and like Bridget is really coming forth as that kind of uh, figure for people to follow. And just all of these festivals, you know, they've become so much more a part of like people really searching for, yeah, that belonging to the land again and that belonging to something a lot deeper. Um, they're really celebrating like the festivals of in bulk of Bialtana, of Lunasa, of Samhain, the equinoxes, the moons. Um, and like, not just in my bubble, you know, it kind of feels like sometimes you're like, oh, everybody's doing this, but just in like our, yeah, local councils and heritage, there's always uh, a lot of, a lot of work done to remind us of the richness of the mythology and the land here. So it seems like readily available for people and uh, yeah, that the earth really wants us all to remember this. So I'm really excited to, to share more about all the different cycles here. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts, Angie? Anything that you'd like to leave folks with? I'm kind of waiting on uh, on Murphy to come back, but they may not. Can you actually hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. I was keeping my mouth shut because I thought Murphy had uh, turned me off. Um, no, I, I mean, whilst we're sitting here, if Murphy is still trying to get back online, um, I know from my, from my point of view, it's just been really lovely connecting with you guys and sort of hearing the questions that are coming through already um, so I think for me it's it's not so much a trip about um, okay now I can see myself uh, it's not so much a trip about as Murphy said it's not a trip about going sightseeing and seeing all these different um, features or tourist features but it's, I think it's very much the sort of trip where hopefully at the end of it you, you come away and you've made some really really good friends um, and this is what I'm finding already just by speaking to you guys this morning. So if anyone else is still out there um, watching, because I can't, my screen should have something weird. I can't actually see who's watching anymore. But if, if anyone's willing to just share a little bit about themselves, I'd love to know um, the community that I'm sitting with at the moment, just to hear about you guys. If you'd, if you'd be willing to share. I'm happy to share. Um, 
I'm uh, sitting with y'all from Western Massachusetts um, on uh, land of the Mohican people and my ancestry uh, lies partially in Ireland, also partially in Norway and Austria. Um, I've never been uh, to Ireland or to any of those other places. Um, but part of the work that I've been doing for a couple of years now is some um, this ancestral uh, connection work and trying to just touch in with my people in that way and have conversations with them and kind of open up myself to uh, your experiential ways of connecting. So it was awesome looking at the crafts uh, that um, you folks did, like the Bridget's Cross and the basket, um, and to know that potentially we'd be working with materials and doing that work because to me, that's a way of really connecting in with ancestral people because folks were doing those very activities um, for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and I have some vulnerability around it because I, I don't know how to do the things and I get um, you know, just working with some of the cultural norms of feeling nervous about uh, you know, not knowing how or not being competent. But to me, that's, that's part of the work is like trying to undo some of those um, expectations of the world that we live in and to recognize that fragility in myself. Um, so, and I, I don't know, I love the stories and just learning and sitting and listening with all of that. So um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm coming from today. Thank you. That's so great. Thank you for sharing, Aurora. I love that suggestion, Angie. Uh, if anybody else wants to pop their video on, bottom left-hand corner, you can just, you know, turn your video on and and come into the video box and just say hello, introduce yourself, um, where you're at, what you're thinking. I'll say a quick intro hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's been really, um, lovely hearing each of you what you shared um i thought it was going to be more just like an informational webinar which most most things like this are so it was very generous how much um each of you told of your wisdom that you hold so my name's anna she and her pronouns i'm from vermont originally and then moved to massachusetts so it definitely sounds like i have some places in common with you all which is kind of something I'm interested in as well to what Aurora was saying, connecting with um, ancestry and all of that. I've been really looking into that a lot lately because I'm an herbalist and just a lot of the ways that we practice herbalism, I think it's really important to look towards our own ancestry and find ways to do um, less harm through not culturally appropriating other people's culture and just really been digging into that lately in the last couple of years. So definitely going to Ireland and Scotland were on my list of things that I wanted to do. And I, I did go on trips to both of those places with my grandparents, which was interesting, but it was very much like the touristy um, version where like just hitting those main sites and not getting to do the things that I wanted to, which were mostly like be in nature. So I was looking for a trip that was more centered around that and, um, I don't, didn't really want to go on my own totally. I was like a little scared to do that. So um, yeah, definitely. I'm just really excited about the idea of wildflowers. Honestly, like the whole, everything else sounds awesome, but just seeing those flowers would make me so happy that like, I don't need anything else. So <laughs> that's like one, one aspect I'm hoping if I do participate that will, yeah. I, where did I see amazing flowers? Greece, I was in Greece in, I think it was May one time in um, Hanya, which is in Crete, and the wildflowers were just unbelievable. My mom's a beekeeper, and so I just think a lot about like, yeah, the flowers and the bees, and then eating the honey, and how like bees are little herbalists, and 
just find all of that so magical. So I could go on forever. I'm a chatter. So bye. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna, for sharing and uh, introducing yourself. Welcome back, Murphy. Glad to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> the internet just completely stopped happening for like 10 minutes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Fine. We, uh, we're just kind of answering some more questions and tapping back into, um, and, and also asking folks if they wanted to introduce themselves, which was really sweet. Awesome. If other people were wanting to introduce themselves, I don't want to disrupt the flow. Anyone else want to pop in and say hello and talk about where you're at, uh, thoughts you have, a little bit about yourself? Love to see you. Um, if no one else wants to introduce themselves, I can pick up a little bit where I was, I left off before. Um, I, uh, I actually, when it comes to like ancestral traditions in Ireland and other places, I take signals from the world around me pretty seriously in terms of communication from the spirits. So I'm, I think I'm not going to tell the story I was about to tell when the internet went away for 10 minutes. I think that was a message. Um, but um, but just to, to finish that broader thought that um, when I was in Sweden, I got to visit a whole burial mound, like giant ancient cemetery there and and um, do some ancestral communication there with the uh, like trans journey, spirit journey skills that I have that I'm happy to walk people through if they want to try that in Ireland. Um, and it was a very powerful experience. So we can definitely engage in some of that if, if that's where people's interests lie. Um, and uh, the the other story that I that I thought I would tell is from uh, my last time in Ireland. Um, two years ago, we went to a place called Cranog in Galway, which has one of the few patches of remaining like virgin oak and hazel forest. Like, there's only like two percent of that forest left, and this was one of the patches. Like, they've tested the soil and, and proved that it's you know un undisturbed uh, since ancient times. And um, so it was this lovely spot because we got to like go into that very like fey feeling forest um, all the time. And um, one of the things that came to us sort of magically during that time was the the host of the eco farm we were staying at came back from an errand one day and was like, Murphy, I have something that you might want, but you might not want it. It's, no, it's a problem if you don't want it. And he took me into this side room and there was this a dead fox. Um, and he he had been driving on the road and had found a freshly road killed fox, a fox kit, an immature fox, red fox. Um, and he brought it back and he's like, oh, you said something about Huntress, I don't know, but like you could use this. And I was like, yeah, we definitely want this box. Uh, we want to honor it and we want to say prayers over it and we want to learn from it. Um, and we ended up skinning that fox and tanning the skin together and everyone got to take home a little patch of, of fox, Irish fox fur. Um, you know, can't guarantee that'll happen on this trip unless we find a roadkill fox, but, um, um, and we did a whole, like, I showed people, like, how you got an animal, and we did a little anatomy lesson, and then we took it out to the forest and, like, sang over it and, and did a whole ceremony of giving it back to the land, and, um, and I, like, got this idea in my head because I've been, um, I usually, like, wear a, uh, a necklace, like, I have some kind of meaningful pendant, and I wear it for, like, years and years and years until it, like, falls off, and then I find another one. And I've been looking, I was looking for another one, hoping to find one while I was in Ireland. Something to wear around my neck that would connect me to my ancestors. And I was like, oh, I bet this fox is like part of that. And I actually happened to have randomly a red fox tooth in my luggage that I hadn't meant to pack that came over from North America. Um, it was just in a bag of other stuff that I had. And I was like, oh, this is from that fox skull. So I was like, I'll do a trade. I'll like give the Irish land spirits this American fox tooth. And then I'll, I'm going to take a fox tooth from this fox. And this will be like the thing that I, that I take home. Um, and so I, I went back to the fox carcass and I like extracted a tooth with my knife and I took it back to the yurt I was staying in and I immediately fell ill. <laughs> um, and we've been telling fairy stories and stories about, you know, how the land spirits are, like can be dangerous um, that week and how they, you know, how they communicate with us sometimes through illness and misfortune if we're not respecting boundaries. 
And um, so I just immediately started feeling sick. It started coming on really fast. I'd been feeling totally fine before. I was like coughing and sneezing all that night long. And in the morning, I was like, I definitely need to give back this fox tooth. So I went back to the forest and I gave back the fox tooth and I like left the forest the American fox tooth. I was like, you can have all the fox teeth. I'm really sorry that I, um, you know, didn't hear. I, I tried to ask permission, but I don't, didn't, he clearly didn't hear that correctly, that answer. Um, and pretty much as soon as I walked out of the forest from returning that fox tooth, I felt better. And like, it had felt like something that was going to last for like five days, like a whole sore throat thing and all this, you know, this sickness that I get every once in a while. Um, and it like immediately cleared up. It was crazy. Um, so it's like one of the strongest experiences I've had of um, like a spirit saying no um, and how, and also then repair you know, doing some reparative work and, and returning the thing and the spirit saying like, okay. Um, and I find um, one of the reasons I'm really drawn to um, introducing people to Ireland and Britain is that I just find the very strong presence there. And I don't know if it's because my own ancestors are from there or if anyone would feel that in the land. Um, but I find the land just feels like thick with ghosts and, and like, you know, not unfriendly ghosts unnecessarily, but um, thick with history. Um, there's like spirit there that's, that's very, very strong. And um, there's so many tales in the traditional lore about how we need to respect that. Um, so, you know, we will be doing some wild food harvesting and stuff on the trip. And we're also going to do it in a really respectful way and make some offerings and ask permission and all of that. And um, also we'll be able to connect that way at the tombs and the sites that Jules asked about as well. So that's my fox story. Does anyone else have questions they would like to ask while you've got us on here? All right. Um, well, then I'm just going to thank you all for, for joining us. You who have stayed till the, the end here have been on for close to two hours. Um, so thanks for choosing to, to use your Saturday morning or Sunday morning or afternoon if you're in, in the UK or in Ireland um, to really think about these things. I think it's really important stuff. Um, we'd be delighted if some of you would like to come along on the trip. Um, I think you've been able to experience here the, the warmth and the thoughtfulness of the people on the staff team and like we're so excited to be working together and to be welcoming everyone into this. Um, so feel free to get in touch um, through email or anything like that if you have more questions you think of or if you want to talk on the phone about things I'm happy to do that. Um, mountainsongexpeditions at gmail.com is the best email to reach me at. And um, you can also look up all these fine folks on their own websites. Um, there's a profile of all the staff on the, on the website for the program and you can link to their various endeavors there. Um, and yeah, thank you. Uh, good luck all of you celebrating in bulk. I hope people are inspired to make some offerings and call in some protection to their houses after everything that Lucy shared. And uh, we hope we'll see you in Ireland. So thanks very much. <laughs>